Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. It's so great to see you on this beautiful morning. Feels like spring out there, doesn't it? The birds are singing and we all know better, right? But at least it, it feels a little better for a little while and uh, it's the end of January. Hallelujah, right? And spring is coming. It'll be here soon and I trust that you're looking forward to it a fourth as much as I am. So praise the Lord, no matter what the weather's like, that God is good and that we have the opportunity to worship him together here at First Baptist. We're glad that you're here. Trust that your heart has, you've come with a heart that's eager to worship the Lord and hear from God, from his word, and fellowship with God's people. We're so thankful that the Lord has brought you here today, especially those of you that are visiting, maybe for the first time or the second or third or fourth time. Thank you for coming. And I trust the service will be a great encouragement and challenge to every single one of our hearts. Please take a few moments to fill out the connection card that you find there in the bulletin. Uh, that's for everybody, not just our visitors, but each and every one of us need to fill one of those out so that we can minister to you and so that we have record of your attendance here today with the, with the people of God and the family of the Lord here at First Baptist Church. So please take the mo a moment to do that and then drop that in the offering plate as the offering is passed here or the plates are passed here in just a few minutes. Also notice a couple quick announcements, about five quick announcements as a matter of fact. Reminder to you that tonight we have our nominations for the deacons for the school committee. That'll be a part of the service. There is an insert in the bulletin that, that uh, if you're a voting member of First Baptist, you need to take a look at to make sure that your name is or is not on that potential nominees list um, based upon your decision whether or not to allow it to be there and the other criteria that is specifically mentioned there at, at the top. So if each of you would take a look at that and if you were accidentally forgotten or accidentally added uh, one way or the other and would let Suzanne Smith know that as soon as possible, Immediately after the service, Suzanne is my administrative assistant and sitting back there. Would you raise your hand in case you don't know who Suzanne is? You can also reach her uh, via email, and that's mentioned there in the uh, bulletin. We want to make sure we have that, that list correct, okay, uh, for tonight's nominations. So uh, please take the time to do that, take a peek at that, and uh, complete those, that information for us. Also a reminder that there's a new members class that's starting next Sunday. If you've not yet signed up for that and you're interested in learning more about First Baptist Church's beliefs and practices, we'd love to have you be a part of that class. Uh, so please let us know. There's a sign-up sheet there. Uh, if you would sign up for that, that'd be wonderful as we get that started next week. Children's membership baptism class as well. And so if you, uh, your child has trusted Christ as their Savior, and typically we ask that they be at least eight years of age, uh, if you'd let us know that there's interest there also. And then we also want to just uh, highlight the fact that there are some financial needs within the church as we complete our budget year. We don't talk about finance as much from the pulpit here at First Baptist, but uh, the end of the fiscal year is the end of February. And usually January and February are the two, two of the lower months in terms of giving. I don't know if it's because of post-Christmas paying off or if it's folks that are snowbirds being away to the south or if it's a, probably a combination of a lot of different factors. And so we just want to encourage you to be faithful to the Lord in your giving so that we can end well our fiscal year as we approach that here this last month. Also want you to notice on the right-hand side of your bulletin lots of ministry opportunities. We'll talk about this a little bit more tonight in our evening service, but there's an opportunity with the orchestra. There are opportunities uh, to serve as a helper with the uh, bus ministry on Wednesday night, Sunday school department, children's church, upcoming evangelism explosion. I hope that every person, my prayer would be that every person at First Baptist Church would have at least one specific ministry that they're doing for the Lord. And if you happen to be a, a person who's not yet doing that, who, ha who hasn't yet settled into a spot to serve God regularly, maybe one of those slots, maybe one of those spots, one, maybe one of those opportunities would be your opportunity to serve God very specifically in and through the ministries of First Baptist. And so pray about the opportunity to serve the Lord in one of those capacities. This morning, our focus is on who God is and how we respond to that in terms of worry, in terms of not worrying. And so I direct your attention, just listen as I read just a, a few of the verses that we'll be studying together from Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus says this, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. And then he goes on to say later in the passage again, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Isn't it great to know this morning that our heavenly Father knows what 
we need. He knows everything that we need. And that in and of itself should help us not to worry, just to know that God knows our needs. Our choir is going to begin our service this morning by singing about the fact that the Father knows all of our needs.
Would you stand, please? We have the assurance that he is a, we are his, and we need not to worry. These words remind us of that. I have. Savior, it's just amazing to think that of the billions of people that have lived over the ages that you know my name, that you know my need, that you've seen every tear that I have shed. And Lord, it brings us great comfort to know that if you care about the lilies in the fields and the, the birds in the air, that you certainly care about man that you made in your image. Lord, I pray that you would guide Pastor as he opens your word this morning, as he shares with us what your word says about worry, about laying our burdens on you, about you knowing the way that is right for us, and sometimes that way leads us through terrible trials and troubles, but you are there, and we thank you for that. Lord, we have some people in our congregation this morning that have gone through some trials. Tom Brune and Lisa Powell, who have both lost some loved ones. We ask that your spirit would be close to them and bring them comfort. We thank you that Larry Gillis has come through his knee surgery successfully this week. Pray for healing for him. And Lord, we lift up Ken Starrett to you. He's been in and out of the hospital and going some, through some real struggles. Um, as a result of the stomach cancer that he has had, and we ask that you would continue to work in his life. We thank you for his faithfulness to you, his cheerfulness uh, through all these trials. We thank you that he is back home from the hospital this week. Lord, for Ibby DeYoung and Tom Lear, who will be, or Tim Lear, who will be having surgery this week, we ask that you would comfort them also, that you would guide the surgeons 
as they do this and that they would have a quick recovery. And Father, we lift up to you the deacon nominations. This is not something that we take lightly. It is indeed a, a responsibility, a great responsibility before you that you will hold these men accountable for their actions. But it is also a great privilege and a sign of spiritual growth in a, a man's life as he draws close to you and desires to serve you and as a congregation it acknowledges that growth in their life. In their life. So Lord, we, we ask that you would guide and direct, that you would give wisdom to the congregation as they vote and that you would give wisdom to the men who are elected as they consider their nomination. And Lord, we would think of our missionary of the week, um, Jeff and uh, Deb Minier, as they work in Bowie, Maryland. We thank you that they have been able to close on their house, pray that they would have speedy renovations done, be able to get in there quickly, and that as they begin to use their home for evangelistic outreaches and as they hold even a neighborhood party, that there would be a good attendance there, that they would really be able to reach out into the neighborhood and start this Bible study and be able to start this church that you have burdened them to do. And then, Lord, we would ask for the church's financial needs that you would provide as you see fit. We thank you for the faithfulness of your people and pray that we would continue desire, to desire to be stretched in our own financial status, that we would use our funds that you have blessed us with to turn around and give back to your ministry, to help those who are in need, to help those who are going around the world and even in our, our own country to share the gospel, and even to meet the needs that we have here in our building, to keep the lights on, to keep the heat on, to maintain it. Lord, we ask that there would be sacrificial giving on the part of your people. We thank you and for this day and pray that you would just be with us, that you would be pleased with our worship today. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your hymn book with me, please. Turn to hymn number 624. 624, stand. Sing this great song together. Great reminder to us, sing the words. Why should I be discouraged? Why should the shadow
turn over to 692, 692. Sing these words with me, would you? Be not dismayed, whatever be time, God will take care.
Good morning, and welcome to Worry Manager's Financial Planning Seminar. My name is Albie, Albie A. Worrywart, and I'm here to facilitate a proactive and positive approach to meeting your every financial need. Now, I'm sure I don't need to remind you good folks about the alarming financial state of affairs of our country. Why, there's never enough money for our schools, and there's not enough money for our hospitals, and no matter how much tax the government sucks out of us, there won't be enough money left in your vulnerable and fragile retirement years. There is no hope. Did I say no hope? Well, perhaps there is one hope. And what is that hope? Worry. Yes, financially troubled individuals, our one hope is worry. Our motto here at Worry Managers is, worry works wonders. Ah, it's worry that motivates us to stay up late at night. It's worry that creates trembling hands and sweaty palms when we open the bank statement. It's worry that sends you out to the store on a, in anticipation to buy a generator during a bad storm. You see, worry works wonders. What does worry do, folks? Oh, come on. Let's say it all together now. Worry works wonders. One more time. Let me hear that worry. Worry works wonders. Now, We've set up a microphone over here so you financially troubled people can share your worries with me. Don't be shy. Step right up. Of course, I, I know the first question that you're going to ask, and that is, well, what are some of the wonders that worry can work? Well, here at Worry Managers, we have a series of wonderful packages aimed at managing all kinds of worry. Now, of course, I am not here to sell you anything. I am not here to take your money. I am here to help you manage your worry with such wonders as life insurance, home insurance, car insurance, identity theft insurance, crime insurance, kidnap and ransom insurance, and our, our most favorite wonder, pet insurance. Now, who will be the first to ask a question? Step right up. Hello. Uh, I, my name is Ima. Welcome, Ima. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a wreck, and, and I, I'm just, you know, I've been a worrier for, oh, at least 20 years, but ever since we started having kids, um, especially when they turn teenagers, I mean, to be honest, insurance is the least of my worries. I'm worried about how to buy vegetables and milk for my six kids. What wonder do you have for that worry? Well, madam, the answer is simple. Buy a farm and you'll have all the milk and vegetables that you need. Before you know it, you'll be selling those extra vegetables at the farm market and riding the cash cow. But don't forget, we do offer worry work crop insurance and worry work flood insurance for your peace of mind. Who will be next? Oh, good. Hi, I'm, my name is Anita Lone. Hi, hi Anita. And I've been worrying since my freshman year of college. I'm a student, and I'm very worried about my financial future. I've even starting to have panic attacks. Oh, good. Very good. It, it, it doesn't feel very good. Young lady, haven't you been listening? Worry works wonders. Now, you have reached the panic stage only just in time. If you start setting aside regular amounts of money every week, why, you should have enough to live on by the time you're 65. 65? Yes. I'm worried about being 25, about my student debts going up. What about my rent? And what about next year's fees? Does worry managers have a wonder that will work for me? It just so happens that we do have the wonder for you. You do? Oh, yes. Our travel agency, Over My Head Travel, can book you on a plane the very second you have, fin hey, you have finished your degree. Let over my head travel whisk you away from all those debts that you've gotten yourself into. And, and may I suggest that when you book your trip that you invest in a, a policy of premier worry work travel insurance. Uh, next question. Um, my name is Al. Hi, Al. Hi, Al. Al K. Seltzer. And... I've only been a worrier for about five years. Since I've been unemployed and on disability, it's been a hard struggle for me and my family. 
I worry about this a lot, and that's why I'm really interested in your wonderful, worry-free health insurance. Hmm. You're sick, you say? Well, well how sick are you? Uh, it's, it's kind of a heart problem, and is there anything that you can do for me? Nothing. Nothing? No, I'm sorry. You should have started worrying when you were fit and healthy now, shouldn't you have? Folks, this is what I've been trying to tell you. Don't leave it too late to worry. You may think that you don't have any worries. I'm here to tell you that you are wrong. What does it take to survive in this commercially driven, financially oriented, wonderfully materialistic world? Worry. You may never have as much money as you need. What can you do? Worry. You may never have as much money as you want. What can you do? Worry. Well, folks, we have run out of time. But remember, tackle life pessimistically and be proactive. And remember, our motto here at Worry Managers, all together now, just one more time, worry works wonders. I noticed you hesitantly clap there. You're not sure if you should or should not uh, applaud that uh, performance that I trust uh, not only made us laugh, but also made us think. And I'm so thankful that uh, God has better answers than that. Aren't you? Amen? And that his word has better answers than that as well. Take your Bible this morning and turn to those answers as they are given to us in Matthew chapter 6 this morning. And, and I want to just say before we begin... Uh, today that I am not immune to what I will be preaching about. Um, sometimes the Lord uh, gives me texts of Scripture. Of course, we're working through the Sermon on the Mount that in some ways you just as soon skip over because it's so convicting to you as the preacher. It's so convicting to me as the pastor because I deal with this and struggle with this just as much as everybody in this auditorium this morning. So in no way, shape, or form do I want you to think that pastor's preaching this message because he's got it all down. And he never, ever worries, never has an anxious moment in his life. That is not true. I am just as prone to it as everybody else. And yet God's word challenges me, I trust, just as much as it challenges you, as we'll see this morning, to, to not be a worrier. It's interesting. Somebody has written about, and they've done a study on worry. It's interesting what people worry about. The study goes like this. It says the average person's anxiety is fo focused on 40% of things that will never happen, 30% of things about the past that can't, that can't be changed, 12% uh, of the worries are things about criticism by others, mostly untrue, 10% about health, which gets worse with worry and stress, and 8% about real problems that will be faced. Those are the things people worry about. About. I, I got a kick out of hearing about an individual that was going through some really tough times, and someone approached them and said, well, aren't you worried about that? And his response was, do you think that would help? <laughs> Obviously, it doesn't, does it? So today we go to God's Word where, where Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25, he says, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. What's the, what's the therefore, therefore? What, what's the context? You need to flip back two weeks ago to where we studied this passage of Scripture together. And the therefore is in light of what he just got finished talking about because Jesus has just finished talking about money. He just finished talking about treasuring eternal things and storing up our treasures in heaven and not getting so focused on the, the temporal and the here and the now and the stuff we face day in and day out, but to think about heaven and to store our treasures up in, to heaven. And so it's in light of that, in that context, that he says to us, therefore, do not worry. And he says it three times. Very specific command is given to us there in verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry. And then if you skip ahead to verse 31, you see it again. Therefore, do not worry. And if you skip ahead to verse 34, you see it again. Therefore, do not worry. So what's Jesus saying here? Do not worry. 
As a matter of fact, he uses that word worry at least six times in this text, not just in those three phrases, but in other phrases. And the word worry, or the word worrying, that is, is used six different times. And it's an interesting word in the New Testament. It's an interesting word in the Greek. I mean, we think about it in terms of anxiety and and things that burden us and distracting cares. But literally, the word worry means to pull in different directions. Isn't that a word picture of the concept of worry because isn't that exactly what it does to us it pulls us in in different directions and so jesus says to us to stop worrying do not worry as a matter of fact that phrase also when translated literally means stop worrying isn't it interesting that god puts it that way because what does that imply for the lord to say stop worrying what does that imply That implies we all do, right? And isn't that true? I mean, is there anybody here this morning that has mastered this issue of anxiety? Because if there is anybody, I'll I'll give you my notes, okay, my Bible, and you can come stand here in my place. Because we all struggle with it. And so he says, stop worrying. I'm reminded of an old sketch, and I know just mentioning the name Bob Newhart for the younger generation, you'll be like, who? What? Bob who? But for the my generation and above, Bob Newhart obviously is, is someone whose name you would recall. But you may remember the, the sketch that he did where he played the part of a, of a psychologist. And, and a woman came in to see him about some anxiety and some struggles and some tough things that she was faced with. And he, he informed her in a very Bob Newhart sort of way that uh, their session would only last five minutes because that's all he ever did with sessions with people for counseling. And it would only cost her $5. And she thought, wow, that's a really good, really good price for a session. And so she went on to explain, and took her about two minutes to explain her situation. And after she got done ex- explaining, and he asked a few questions, his counsel to her as this professional was simply this, stop it. And she started to go on about what it was she was so anxious about. And he said, hold it, stop it. And she again was like, don't you care about my, my life deal? You know, what's happening here? And he's like, stop it, stop it, stop it stop it over and over he just kept saying to her stop it and i i'm thankful today that the lord's not quite that uh way if you want to call it that but he is in a sense saying stop it he is in a sense saying to us stop worrying and this morning his answer is a lot more than stop it his answer gives us reasons that we can and reasons that we ought to stop worrying in light of who he is and how he cares for us, and what he wants to do for us, and how great of a God our God is. And so this morning, he wants us to stop worrying, and he gives us at least three reasons in this text of Scripture in reference to that. Number one, the first reason is found here in verse 25 when he goes on to say this, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the, and the body more than, than clothing? And so Jesus says to us, number one, stop worrying because of, of God's perspective. And he states it in two different ways. He states it in terms of the essentials of, what, of life and that he describes for us in verse 25 here the things that are, that are the core of, of existence in terms of what we need from a temporal, from an earthly standpoint. He, he refers to food and he refers to, to water and he fer, refers to clothing, things that we would define as needs. I mean, the very, the very necessities of life, which in some ways may actually be a little bit difficult for us to relate to as modern American Christians in a society where, for the most part, those basic necessities are, are given to us. I mean, the average Jew lived in a little different world than the world in which we live. The average Jewish person that he'd be speaking to here spent a large portion of their income, a far greater portion of their income, just to put food on the table than, than Americans do. Really, we, we spend a fairly small, small amount of our income on making sure we have food on our tables, and yet they, they spent a large portion of that. And, and, and water was scarce in the Middle East. It wasn't something like we have plentifully here in the United States in terms of wells and, and, and running in our faucets and those types of things as well. So that was something that was scarce as well. And then clothes, clothing was expensive. And the average Jewish person this day had one set of clothing. It was what they were wearing. That was it. They didn't have entire closets full of of clothing to wear. And so the basic necessities of life were not a given. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught them and he teaches us, give us this day our what? Our daily bread. Not our decade bread. Not our 
bread for forever and ever until I die type of thing. No, give us this day our daily bread. And so the things that they would have even worried about are, are maybe a little bit difficult for us to comprehend because, I mean, think about comparing those to the average things that an American worries about. Whether or not their health insurance will be adequate. They didn't have health insurance. Whether or not the stock market is up or down and what the impact of that will be on their retirement fund. There were no such things as retirement funds. Whether or not they'll have enough money to purchase their next iPhone. Whether or not they'll have enough money to pay that $250 cell phone bill or that $200 satellite dish, satellite TV cable television bill. It's a little different than food and water and the necessities of life and clothing. And yet the point here that Jesus is making is not that those things are bad, but, but the point that Jesus is even making here is, is not only about the essentials of life, but he's making a point about the essence of life when he, when he says here in the latter portion of verse 25, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food? Is not life more than, than your clothing? In other words, the essence of life is that, that life is not about the physical stuff. Life is not about material things. There's more to life than just what we're facing here and what we're facing now. What life is all about is what we'll face someday in eternity. And later in this text of Scripture, he's going to say, seek first the kingdom. He's going to say, worry about the things that are eternal. Okay, maybe not worry. Be concerned or focus on the things that are eternal instead of always focusing on the things that are temporal and physical in nature because life is not about just stuff. Life is not just about the physical. Life is about the eternal. The real you doesn't have to have all of the stuff to truly be happy. You see, contentment is a matter of a relationship with God and, and, and focusing on those things that matter most to him. Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13 are powerful verses, and most of us can quote verse 13. I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. But the context of Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, the context is this. I have learned in whatever state I am therewith to be content. And so the context there is that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because I've learned to be content with whatever it is that God has given to me. And as I find contentment in him, whether all of my physical needs, whether all of my financial problems are taken care of, whether they're all this and that, whether or not they're all taken care of, I can find contentment in him, and then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because a, a, a godly, mature, growing Christian sees life through a whole different set of lenses. A set of lenses that looks to eternity. Things that are spiritual and things that really matter the most. And so because of life's perspective, life's perspective that life isn't about stuff and it isn't about my comfort and, and everything just being perfect in my life, life is about eternity. And when life is about eternity, I'm far less apt to worry. So we can stop worrying because of God's perspective. Secondly, though, the Bible goes on to say we can stop worrying because of God's provision. Look at what it says in verses 26 through 32. Verse 26 says, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And the answer is, yes, absolutely. And then verse 27, Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Who's going to get taller by worrying is what Jesus is saying. And the ab obvious answer there is nobody and then notice what he goes on to say, verse 28. So why do you worry? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Notice different ideas here that Jesus is communicating to us in relationship to his provision. First of all, the examples of God's provision in verse 26 and then in verses 28 and 30. Jesus was, was remember, he was preaching this sermon on the mount, so he was outdoors. And so it's very likely that Jesus pointed to the birds that perhaps were in the trees above him or a, a, above his audience and says, you know, does God take care of them? And does God provide for a lily? Does not God not provide for, for, for them? 
And if God cares about them, don't you think God cares about you? I mean, when's the last time that you saw a bird struggling with anxiety or being treated for hypertension or going to the doctor for ulcers, right? And, and it's not that God is saying that, that birds aren't busy and they aren't active and, and that we ought to all just do nothing, you know? No, he's not saying that. What he's saying is God, God takes care of the birds and if God takes care of the birds, God's gonna take care of us. It's not that birds' lives are problem-free. Obviously, they can, they can starve to death in the bad winter, and they can be prey to a predator and all those types of, of things. And yet what he's saying is, I, I care about them, and I care about you so much more. Jesus' point is that even the life of a bird is in God's hands. And he takes care of them. And if he cares for birds, he cares for you, and he cares for me so much more. And he uses the same example of, of lilies and the clothing of lilies and how beautiful flowers are. And, and he says, you know, it weren't, weren't, aren't lilies so much better than, than even Solomon and all of his grandeur and the finest clothes that, that money can buy? And again, he makes the same point that our lives are in his hands because he cares about us. And he will provide for us. The example of God's provision. But then also notice the exhortations then related to God's provision. Look at what it says in verse 27 when it says this, which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Is life better because you've worried? Is what he's saying. And we all know better than that. We all know that life is not better. Worry doesn't make your life better. Dr. Charles Mayo, who was one of the brothers that founded the the now famous Mayo Clinic said the following. He says, I've, I've never met a man or known a man to die of overwork, but I've known a lot who died of worry. Worry doesn't make things better. It only makes things worse. And the key to understanding why we worry, though, is found then in verse 30. If you skip down to the end of verse 30, when Jesus says this, will he not much more clothe you? And then there's this little phrase that I have underlined, and I would encourage you to underline it in your Bible as well. He says, oh, you of little, What? faith little faith because that's that's the problem that's the challenge that's that's what happens when we worry is we're we're not looking to the lord and we're not trusting him we're trusting ourselves and our resources and, and our ability to solve the problem and change the situation and get it all figured out and planned out instead of realizing that's god's job don't try to do god's job instead trust him it's interesting, this phrase, oh, you of little faith, is found four times in the gospel accounts, and every time it's used, Jesus is not really very happy with his disciples because what he's, what he's brought them to is a situation in their lives where they're faced with a crisis, and in the midst of that crisis, they don't respond in faith. Instead, they respond with taking things to their own hands or worrying about it or, or whatever the case may be. Every one of those times, there's a crisis, and he says to them, Oh, you of little faith. And he says the same thing to us when we worry. Because the core issue is, is our faith and realization of who God is and how great he is and how he cares for every one of us and wants to meet our every needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. It's amazing that, that we as Christians can trust God for our eternal destiny and yet struggle to trust him for our necessities of life. I mean, I mean, really, which is the bigger deal, right? Heaven, eternity, the forgiveness of sins, or paying the water bill, or some other health struggle, or the relationship dis issues, or whatever it is that we're faced in life. If you can trust him for eternity, don't you think you can trust him for life on earth? Absolutely, oh ye of little faith. And so we see the exhortations related to God's provision. But then thirdly, notice the expression then of God's provision as it's described for us in verse 32, where the Bible says this, for after all these things, the Gentiles seek. What is he saying? What he's saying is, you know, if you get all wrapped up in the material and the physical and all that kind of stuff, you know what? You're really not much different than an unbeliever because what are they all wrapped up in, right? All that kind of stuff. And so don't let your focus be on the material and the physical and the stuff of life. Instead, notice what he goes on to say at the end of verse 32, when he puts it this way, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Your heavenly 
Father knows that you need all these things. Someone's written a poem that goes like this. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. You see, our father knows. Our father knows our every need. Does God know about your health issues? Does God know about your job problems? Does God know about your bills? Does God know about your kids? Does God know about the world situation? And all God's people should say, Amen. He knows. And not only does he know, he cares. Our Father knows that you have need of all these things. And yet worry reveals our view of God. I mean, we'd never say it. We'd never say, well, I don't think God's in control. Or I don't think God cares. Say it, but what does worry Worry, in essence, says, well, I'm not sure that that God knows about this one. I'm not sure God cares about this one. I'm not sure God's going to help me with this. And and in a sense, it's almost like saying, maybe God's not powerful enough to take care of this one. Or maybe he just doesn't care about me. When in reality, we all know God knows, God cares, and God's got this, as Dr. Jordan kept saying to us last week. I've got this. My Father knows that you have need of all these things. And so for us, the worry almost demeans who God is as our Father who knows our every need. And so we don't have to worry, or we can stop. We can stop worrying because of God's provision. And then thirdly, notice, we can stop worrying, stop it, because of God's priorities. Notice what verse 33 goes on to say, a familiar verse, probably one that most of us here today have memorized or we've sung the song about it, where it says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. What, what is he saying there? What he's saying to us is this, because of my priorities, you don't have to worry. Focus on what really matters. We talked about this earlier in this series about what what is the kingdom of God and what exactly does that mean? And just just to simplify that concept, it it again is all the things that are eternal. It's, It's God's reign in my heart, the kingdom of God in that sense, but it's also God's eventual reign in the millennial kingdom and the fact that someday we're gonna get to rule and reign with him and 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 life is going to change in terms of its perspective because of the kingdom. And so things that matter are things that are gonna be a part of the kingdom. Not just the physical here and now, but the eternal and the souls of men. Those types of things, that's what it means to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, live righteously in a manner that pleases him. Do do what is right, is what he's saying. Make the the pursuit of, of those kinds of things number one in your life. Focus on what really matters instead of focusing on what doesn't matter. Connie Mack was a baseball coach that coached baseball a century ago. You big baseball fans may recognize that name. But he was one of the greatest managers in the history of baseball, won a world championship five times, and was one of the winningest coaches in history. And one of the secrets of his success was how he managed people, okay, and how he dealt with problems. And so he was a guy that, what, that admitted that he had gotten to the point where really he didn't worry much. And he said the following in relationship to that. He said, I discovered that worry was threatening to wreck my career as a baseball manager. I saw how foolish it was, and I forced myself to get so busy preparing to win games that I had no time left to worry over the ones that were already lost. I I made myself busy focusing on winning games instead of focusing on the games that I had lost. And I think he kind of captures the idea here of what Jesus is saying is is get busy doing the things that matter. And and when all you're focused on is seeking first the kingdom and and your your focus is on his righteousness, a lot of the stuff of life just kind of becomes details. 
that, that, that fades into the, into the background because you're focused on just doing what's right and impacting lives for Christ and being a testimony and sharing the gospel and, 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 and having an impact. You're seeking first the kingdom. You see, people are typically doers or stewers. People are typically doers or stewers. You know what a steward is, right? That's a worry wart. Versus what Jesus is saying is, don't be a steward, be a doer. Be somebody that's so actively doing everything you can for Christ that some of the stuff that, that you would stew about just, just kind of fades into the background because you're a doer. You're seeking first the kingdom of God. Put Christ first and let him take care of your needs because that's what the verse goes on to say. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these what? Things. What is that? That's the needs of life. All these things will be added unto you. You do what you're supposed to do and let me do what I'm supposed to do is what God's saying. And I'll, I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. I will meet your every need. And so we are to focus on what really matters. Get busy doing all you can for Christ and let him take care of the other stuff. Secondly, he doesn't just say focus on what really matters, but then he also says, and face today's problems. Notice, face today's problems. Or as Jesus, Jesus put it in verse 34, therefore, do not worry. Here it is again. Therefore, stop worrying. And then he goes on to say, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will, will worry about its own things. And then notice what he says, sufficient for the day is its own, its, own, its own trouble. In other words, there's enough to focus on today that there's no sense in focusing on and worrying about tomorrow. Focus on or face today's problems, not tomorrow's problems. You see, today's problems are are tough. I understand that, but they aren't too much. It's when we pile on all of tomorrow's problems that we become overwhelmed and worry. Just face today's problems. I like the way Walter Kelly put it when de describing worry. He said this, worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. Worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. So much of what we worry about is in the future. And yet Jesus says, focus on today. Focus on today's challenges. Are you doing that? We don't have to worry. We don't have to worry because we have a God whose perspective is eternal, not just physical. We don't have to worry because we have a God who says, I'm going to take care of you. You're better than a bird. You're better than a lily. I've got this. We don't have to worry because we can seek first the kingdom of God and then he will add all these things to us. This morning I'd like you to, if you're taking notes, I'd like you to right now, write down, or if you're not taking notes and you want to just think about it in your mind, what are the top one, two, or three things about which you worry? What are the top things? And I know, just by bringing that up right now, you're like, oh, pastor, you just made me sin. All right, I just worried because you brought it up. All right, I don't mean to do that on purpose, all right? But I want you just to think, what, you know, what is it you find yourself worried about? Number one, and if there are two and three, please don't list 37, okay? All right, there may be that many. But your top one or, or two or three things right now, okay? Can you think of those or can you write them down? Everybody? Either think of them or write them down, either one. Give you a second to do that. One, two, three, perhaps. And then I want to ask you some questions in relationship to this passage of Scripture we just studied. Number one, of what nature are they? Are they material or are they spiritual? And what is the essence of life? Is it food, water, and the physical, or is it the eternal? You see, that should make a difference in whether or not you worry about it. Question number two, as you think about those one, two, or three things, are those situations in life more, impor more important than birds? And the answer is, yes, they are. So who's taking care of it? 
God is. That's right. The Lord is. Question number three. Does your father know about those worries? Those situations. Does, does he know about those? Absolutely. Can you trust him to handle them? Do you think he can, he can take care of this one? Absolutely. So don't worry. Question number four. How, and this is probably the deepest of all these questions and most thought-provoking. How can you, in the midst of that problem, see the kingdom of God? How can you, in the midst of that potential worry, seek first the kingdom of God? Have an eternal perspective and a righteous response to whatever it is that you're facing that you could find yourself worrying about because that's what he wants you to do. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then last question, actually I've I've got a second part to this one as well, but is it today's worry or is it really tomorrow's? Is it today's worry? In other words, is there something that you can do about it today other than pray and leave it in God's hands? Or is it really tomorrow's? If it's tomorrow's, leave it there. Leave it there. And then the final question that really wasn't in my set that complements all of these is, will you trust God with your worries? Because that's the answer. Will you trust him? Will you trust him by praying and saying, God, I cast all of my cares upon you because you care for me. Will you trust him by, by not shouldering those loads, but letting him shoulder them for you because he's the God who cares about you more than any bird or any lily. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is amazing to think that you know my needs. You know my every thought. And you are able to take care of every anxiety, every problem. You promise to do so. Lord, we confess our propensity to sin by worrying.